You are listening to Meet the Thriller Author, the podcast where I interview writers of mysteries, thrillers, and suspense books. I'm your host, Alan Peterson, and this is episode number 181. In this episode of the podcast, we'll be meeting Nick Petrie, who is the best-selling author of the award-winning Peter Ash series. The seventh novel in that series, The Runaway, will be published on January 18th. He lives in Milwaukee, where he's hard at work on the next Peter Ash novel. Make sure to visit thrillerauthors.com for show notes and to access the archives of all the shows. You can also sign up for the uh, Thrilling Reads mailing list to get great deals on thriller, mystery, and suspense books. All right, here is my interview with Nick Petrie. Welcome to the podcast, Nick. Thanks, Alice. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I know you're uh, busy uh, <laughs> this week uh, leading up to the release of your book. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty, can you tell us a little bit about your background uh, before you started writing and publishing novels? Well, sure. Well, I've been writing uh, forever since high school, um, but I wrote also for 25 years without getting anything published. I wrote three books uh, that uh, I got a little farther down the publishing path with each book. But uh, it was my fourth book called The Drifter that really, uh, well, that was my first published novel. And it was nominated for five awards and won two. So uh, that was a pretty good uh, uh, way to get going. My, a friend of mine refers to me as the 25-year overnight success, uh, which I think <laughs> is about right. Yeah, isn't that usually how it is? Even uh, when that first novel hits big and everyone's like, oh, overnight success. And you don't know all the years behind it, all the manuscripts that didn't make it. <laughs> well, that, that's what being a writer is like. It really, it takes a long time, unless you're one of those, I mean, again, there are people who just sort of seem to come out of the womb with that gift. Um, and a couple of my friends are like that, uh, and I like them anyway. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, for me, it, it, it took me a long time to, to, get, good, to get good enough uh, to, keep, to get comfortable, to get confident. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. So even when you were doing other things, uh, other jobs, you were always, uh, always writing uh, at, at all times? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I started my first business when I was 21, and I did it primarily because I, it would give me more flexibility in terms of time. Um, I, I was working as a renovation carpenter, and, and I realized that if I started my own business, I wouldn't have to start at 7 a.m., which is kind of when the industry started. Um, so I could both miss the rush hour by starting a little bit later and I could have the morning, a little bit more time in the morning to write. Uh, and I kind of organized my life around that principle through three different businesses. It's a weird, it's a weird pathway, but it's really allowed me time to keep working. Yeah. So when I was reading your bio was, uh, uh, about your carpentry background, it reminded me of, uh, Harrison Ford uh, was doing carpentry too. So he could be between auditions. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I, uh, I used to renovate old houses and, uh, build furniture and and uh, you know custom cabinets, kitchens, the whole deal. And I, I actually I missed that work. It was it was very satisfying, and the 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 physical nature of it. You could turn around at the end of the day and say, "This is what I did today. I made that." Uh, and writing is not at all uh, like that. Some days I write a lot of words and then I delete them the next day. Some days I don't do anything, but I make a lot of progress in my head. Uh, it's a it's a uh, it's a quirky life. And were you always a fan of the um, uh, like the thriller and the mystery genres uh, as a reader before you started writing these? I, it, it is. I, I, I read mysteries growing up, um, although I, I didn't think that that was what I wanted to do. I, I guess I, I don't I don't know quite why. But, the I, you know, I wanted to be Ernest Hemingway in high school. And then in college, um, I started reading Jim Harrison and I really loved him. And I, so I thought, OK, now I want to be Jim Harrison. And then after college, I read Cormac McCarthy. Uh, I read All the Pretty Horses, and I thought, oh, now, okay, now I want to be Cormac <laughs> McCarthy. Um, but really what reading that, that Cormac McCarthy novel did for me, um, it won the National Book Award. It's a fantastic novel, but it's also, it's a cowboy novel, right? At, at base, it is, it is a, it is a, it's a book about teenage cowboys. It just, it just is working on such a high level. And it really made me think that, I could tell the kinds of stories that I want to tell about people living on the margins of society, about, about you know, crime and punishment and uh, all of those things, that, that if I could do that at a high level, that uh, that, that was okay somehow. Like it, it, wasn't, it wasn't okay to think about telling crime stories when, of course, that's, you know, that's just bullshit because there are, you know, there's literature at every spot on, on, uh, in the publishing world. 
uh, you know, some, some books are just better than others. That's really how I think about it. They, they work more for me than, than others do. Um, but that was the, that was the sort of eye opener for me that, that crime, which I'd always read that that was really my home. And how did the, uh, how did the Peter Ash series uh, come to be for you? So you started getting these, that, that idea like that you were just saying, and then uh, you, you started uh, plotting it out or how, how did that come together for you at first? Well, after I, I, uh, I ran a renovation business. I started a, a home inspection business. So if you buy a house, you hire a guy like me to tell you what's wrong with it. Um, and I, this was in the, you know, after the surge in Iraq. And so I had all these customers who were veterans who were coming home from war overseas. And, and one of the, the funny things about being a home inspector is that you are present at a, a, a very important moment for people. There's a lot of emotional resonance when they're buying their first house. Um, it, it carries a lot of weight. I, I'm somebody that they, they spend three or four hours with. We talk about the house and how it works and, and what they might want to do to it. Um, and we also end up talking about people's lives um, because you're spending a lot of time together. And I, I, all these veterans were telling me stories about their life. And, and I am someone who people always have told me stories. Strangers will, will tell me things in line at the grocery store. Uh, I don't know if it's just I have that kind of face or because I'm really interested in people. But so I, I realized I had all these clients coming back from war who were had really been affected by it. And, and it really made me interested in, in what that might be like to have had the most profound experience in your young adult life and then come home and have essentially no support and try to figure out how to make your life, you know, what the next phase of your life would be, and I realized that that was the kind of character that I uh, wanted to write about, and that through whom I could tell some interesting and exciting stories. And so now, so the Runaway. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, and uh, what the story about the in the latest? Sure. Um, Peter Ash is our hero, and he's a again a Marine Corps veteran, and he's uh, on a gravel road in a remote corner of Nebraska, and he comes upon a young woman named Helene. Uh, her car has broken down. She's in enormously pregnant, uh, and she's trying to escape from her husband, who is an ex-police officer and a very bad man. Uh, Peter offers to help because that's the kind of person he is, uh, but things don't go well for either of them. It's a story of sex, obsession, and murder, but also of the strength and the resilience to do whatever is necessary to survive. And I noticed uh, when I was doing a little research before the for the interview that uh, I, I, that this is the first novel uh, in the series where you're actually having a, a female perspective POV aside from Peter Ashes. So of course I would need to ask what, what why did you decide to tackle that and how was it getting into a, the a female character's uh, head? Well, there it's the I have other character points of view in previous books, but they they tend to be small. Mm. Um, and in this book, really, Helene has half the book is from her point of view. Um, and, and it wasn't what I set out to do at all. I, I just, uh, the, the, uh, this idea for this, this young woman sort of showed up and I started to write her. And, you know, I just, I just liked her so much. She was so interesting to me and her voice was so strong. And the problems I'd given her were, were so compelling. Um, so she just kept you know, she just, she just kept demanding more time. I would write a few chapters and, and I would say, okay, now it's going to be Peter's turn. And then, and then I would need to write a few more chapters from Helene's point of view. Um, and, you know, as a writer, I, I just try to follow, you know, the good stuff. I try to follow the stuff that's the most interesting that seems to work the, the best on the page. And, and as a result, Helene just got a lot of airtime. But, you know, your other question, which is writing women, I mean, my whole life, I've been surrounded by strong women, my, my both my grandmothers, uh, my mom, uh, my sister, my wife, uh, you know, strong, accomplished, smart women, and, and, you know, all the women in my life, my, my friends uh, are, uh, you know, you know, that's who that's who I'm interested in as human beings. So writing a, a strong, uh, opinionated uh, woman is not a challenge. That's just that's just part of my life. But, you know, I, I think it's, it's not hard to write characters who are different from you, as long as you remember that they're people first. You know, I, I have a recurring character named Lewis, who's a career criminal, but my, I don't write him as a black character. I write him as a character who happens to be black. And so it's just a very simple shift in perspective. You know, Helene is not a female character. She's a character who's a female. Mm. 
And, and that, that small shift in perspective lets me really think about what are the characteristics of a human being as opposed to what are the characteristics of a woman or what are the characteristics of a black person or a, a Hispanic person or, or a gay person? Or, I mean, I, again, my, my books tend to have a pretty diverse cast of characters. And, and I think, you know, thinking about, you know, what we have in common, what we share as human beings is really a, a great way to tap into uh, people who are different from you is to think first about the ways in which we are the same. And in that sort of act of empathy, it's, it's a really great way to access not only characters who aren't like you, but characters who are, who are complex, characters who are not one dimensional. Um, I, there, you know, there will never be a character in, in uh, you know, one of my books who, no matter what, how small of a role who is, you know, has chiseled good looks and, and you know, chiseled abs and is just a, a, a wholehearted boy scout, you know, even Peter, my, my hero, you know, has a dark side. He's a complicated person. He doesn't always do the right thing. And I think that's what makes people interesting is, is that complexity. It seems like in the book, the, uh, uh, the locations are always a, a big part of your, of your stories. And in this one, uh, it's set in Northern uh, Nebraska. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Why you chose that area? And, uh, and, and, and do, do you go there when you write your books, do you research the locations? Do you go out there? I'm kind of curious about that process as well. No, I, I always research the locations in person. I think it's really important not just to sort of look at a picture on the internet, but to see how it smells, to, to drive the roads, to, uh, you know, you, and I always get a lot of ideas as well um, from going to places. Um, so I, I'm a big, big on in-person research for sure. For me, you know, setting is, is really a character. Uh, there are, again, there are, there are writers who, who set their books in sort of any town, uh, USA. And, and again, that's, that's fine. It's just not really what I'm interested in writing about. I like writing about very specific places and those places always suggest to me certain kinds of stories. This book, right? So the, the Great Plains, the Northern Plains are uh, so primal. It's, it's this vast open space under an enormous sky. Um, it really, for me, it has a, a really visceral kind of impact. Uh, but along with the beauty, it, it's really a, a harsh and unforgiving landscape, and parts of it are, are really desolate, uh, and not just you know physically, but also economically. The, the population is shrinking in many of these towns. Communities are often really struggling, and fewer and fewer jobs. And so that is sort of the undercurrent running through this book is that is that it's a landscape that makes you feel small, and it's a it's a it's a community setting where there are fewer and fewer opportunities. So that's sort of a contrast between um, you feel really small, but at the same time, the walls are kind of closing in. And so that to me is the, is the setting uh, that became the story of sort of resilience in the face of hardship. And so now this book is the seventh in the series. I'm kind of curious how Peter Ash has evolved throughout the years. Uh, how's that the process been for you so far? It's, it's, both one of the greatest pleasures and the greatest challenges of writing a series is, is keeping things uh, fresh and new along the way. Peter does have a, 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 very, a, a very broad character arc. So he begins in the series, he's really, he, he's got post-traumatic stress from his time in combat. And at, at the first book, it's really quite debilitating on a certain level. Um, he's claustrophobic. It's hard for him to be inside for very long at all. But it's also Peter's characters that he's pushing back against that. And he is he is resolved to not have that own him, to not have that define him, but to try to uh, you know make change in the world uh, regardless. Uh, and then from that point, we see Peter's progress through his post-traumatic stress. And war never leaves you. I have uh, conversations with Vietnam vets you know, their, their war was 50 years ago and they still dream about it. You know, they still think about it every day. So Peter's war is never going to go away. He can make progress through this challenge. And, and part of my goal, you know, my personal goal is to have Peter be a little bit of a role model. The military is not known for being super touchy feely. It's really all about uh, being strong and, and not showing weakness. Um, and, and so, you know, Peter is a, is a good way for me to sort of show, well, here are some ways that you can help yourself. Here are some simple things that you can do if you are struggling from your experience at war 
Um, it's, it's simple stuff like join a veterans group. If you, if you talk about your experience with other people who can empathize with that experience, that goes a long, long way towards helping you normalize that experience and, and help diminish your symptoms. Um, there, there are a couple of other things that Peter does uh, as well. Um, you know, the army has programs for meditation and yoga, which is enormously helpful. It sounds kind of woo woo and groovy, but uh, you know, if the army's doing it, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a pretty good thing to do. Um, so that's, those are some of the things that I'm sort of trying to do and to show Peter's sort of path through to normalcy. Um, and I get, I get all of this, uh, you know, mail and, and online messages from vets who are reading Peter, uh, who say, uh, wow, I didn't, like, I didn't know that, like, I thought I was going crazy. And then I realized from reading your books that I actually had post-traumatic stress. And thank you so much for helping me figure out how to get some help. Um, I, I get messages from, from people who give my books to their partners who've been to war um, or, or who say that my books help them understand uh, their partners who've been to war. So it, like that is completely unexpected and, and gratifying in, in terms of how, how uh, sort of the, the arc of the character and, and the, the response to it. Um, but in, in terms of what stories to tell, I mean, that's a, you know, I've, I've now written seven of these. And so there are seven storylines I cannot repeat that, you know, there are seven topics that I don't get to go back to. And so it's become a, a, a much bigger challenge to try not to repeat myself. Uh, but the, you know, I did sort of unwittingly make some of this a little easier because there were only three recurring characters in the series. There's Peter, there's Lewis, who is Peter's best friend uh, and a career criminal, sort of semi-reformed, uh, um, and June Cassidy, his girlfriend. A and each book takes place in a different location. So um, the stories can really feel different and can really draw on different parts uh, of, of America. And that, that's kind of my other theme is trying to dive into uh, you know, this giant and diverse country that we live in and to try to tell, you know, what kind of story might you tell that takes place in Memphis? What kind of story might you tell that takes place uh, in, in Colorado? What kind of story might you tell that takes place in Milwaukee? So that, and that's all part of the fun and it is also part of the challenge, quite frankly. What's your, like your writing uh, process like then? Like you get the idea for the story do you like outline or do you just like write from the, on the, from the seat of your pants? Or? It's very generous to say that I start with an idea from a story. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of start with a feeling. I start with, with setting and kind of an assignment. So for this book, the, my assignment was that I wanted to tell uh, kind of a smaller, more personal story. The, my, my, uh, many of my other books have sort of larger stories with much larger consequences. Um, but this is a, a, a more personal story with a very powerful personal consequence. It, it's, it's what's at stake really is not just one person's life, but kind of her soul. So, so that was sort of my assignment. And then Nebraska sort of suggests a certain kinds of stories. And so, the, and from there, sometimes a character shows up, sometimes a, a sort of a, a circumstance shows up. And in this case, Helene just kind of appeared in my head this young woman working uh, at a remote gas station at the western edge of the Northern Plains. She's all alone. She's desperate to change her life. But every person she knows, especially her boss, is trying to control her, to kind of own her. And, and starting from that point, I had to figure out how Helene could get her, could move her own story along in a way. Uh, so characters to me are really the drivers for the plot. And of course, I'm interested in, in fun, fast, exciting stories. And so the, the characters, you know, gravitate in that direction. The nuts and bolts of your of your writing process. Uh, do you um, like what was the writing day look like for you? Do you like have set hours? Do you have word count goals when you're when you're working on a project? Uh, it kind of depends on where I am in the course of the project. I, I do. Uh, I, I generally have a word count goal, uh, although I try to be a little forgiving. One of the problems I have is procrastination. So I'll just, I'll start surfing the web or I'll, you know, <laughs> quote unquote research, right? Oh, I just have to look something up. And then you fall down this rabbit hole. Uh, my, my, in general, I, I basically get up and go to work. I get up, I make breakfast, I make a pot of coffee and I bring my breakfast to my desk. Um, and in a perfect world, I open the document and I eat my breakfast and I stare at the document and I 
you know, I, I start with the, the previous day or two work and I say, oh, there's a sentence that needs to be fixed. It could be better. You know, oh, I need to reorganize this paragraph. And then I, you know, and if, when things are going well, that just, you know, kind of rolls forward. And then I'm, then I'm working on the next thing. Um, and I, you know, I at least go until lunch, depending on how much else I have to do. And lunch for me is about two o'clock in the afternoon. And, but when it's crunch time, I, I, you know, I go until, you know, two or three, I eat lunch. I go for a little walk to kind of get the blood moving. And then I go back to work and I'm off at my desk until six uh, when I'm really trying to get the book out deadline is approaching. And I, I, I tend to work six or seven days a week, um, not as intensely on the weekend, but I just, for me, it helps to kind of keep my hand on the book and to, and to remember what it is I'm working on. Uh, and I'll know that the book is really going when I'll be in the shower and an idea will show up or I'll be on a walk and I'll have to pull out my phone to take some notes because some stuff like my brain just starts to turn over um, and the next piece of the story shows up. Um, the, the other thing I really try hard not to do, I, I, I love podcasts, but I try not to, it, it's, they're actually, I, I find them really uh, uh, seductive to have you know, these voices in your ear, it's a very intimate uh, thing, which is I think why podcasts are such a big deal now. Um, but it's really easy for me to fall into that. And so I try not to uh, listen to a podcast when I'm making my breakfast. I try to just sort of be in my head and to sort of let whatever thoughts show up, show up because I'm a very intuitive writer. I don't, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a pantser. I'm not a plotter. I, I'm, I'm not working from an outline. I just sort of try to follow the story from the beginning to the end. Uh, and then I go back and I, you know, chop it up and edit it and and, uh, and go from there. Do you have like a music in the background or you need silence? Uh, I need not other people's voices uh, <laughs> and, and working at home in the pandemic with my wife also working at home. And uh, my son has been home from college for a couple of, of the big, long chunks of time for the last couple of years. So that that is a challenge. I've, I've got noise canceling headphones, which have really saved my butt. Um, and uh, depending on what kind of mood I'm in, there's a, a, uh, a thunderstorm podcast. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's just, it's eight hours of thunderstorms. You hear rain and thunder, and, mm -hmm. um, which is a great sort of white noise distraction. Uh, and I also have this, oh, I don't know, it's about a 25 hour playlist of instrumental jazz that I've been building for 10 years that has become sort of Pavlovian for me. I have a couple places that I can, that I can begin it. Um, depending on, you know, kind of what frame of mind I want to be in or what kind of work I have to do that day. So it's either, it's, it's either or of those typically. Uh, and if I actually have a day when there's nobody else home, which does not happen very often in the pandemic, yeah. um, you know, then I actually will open my door and, and uh, just let the house be the house. But that's, unfortunately, that's just not how it works these days. Yeah. And uh, so what's next for you and uh, Peter Ash? Are you, is there, are you working on the eighth, eighth in the series or what's? Uh, I am working on the eighth in the series. I am not as far along as I would like to be, uh, <laughs> which is generally, generally the state of affairs for me uh, and for my, my uh, editor. But I'm very lucky in that they do not harass me. They're, they're uh, being very kind to me, actually. So uh, I, once, once the new book comes out and, uh, and I'm done doing all this uh, promo stuff, which I actually really enjoy. I love these conversations. Because usually I'm, you know, locked in my office and I, I, I get to talk to other writers. I get to talk to readers. Like it's, you know, I'm doing this for something, right? Then it's going to be nose to the grindstone and I got to get this next book uh, figured out and on the page. All right. And then uh, before I let you go, Nick, I always like to ask, because I know I have uh, uh, listeners who are aspiring writers out there. Um, any advice for an aspiring thriller mystery writer listening? Oh, so much advice. Yeah, um, right. yeah. And it really depends on kind of where you are in your own journey. I guess I would say a couple of things. One is be patient and persistent. Uh, it, it took me, I, I wrote three books I couldn't get published uh, until my fourth book. A friend of mine refers to me as the 25 year overnight success. So, you know, and that's not the exception. That's the rule. I, I, I know many, many writers who it took them many, many years uh, to get published. You know, if, if, if you read a story about a writer who they're 25 and it's their first attempt writing a novel, you know, that is not how it goes for almost anybody. Um, so be patient, be kind to yourself and, and keep it work. Uh, that would be the one thing. And, and, you know, keep, keep showing up at, at, at your desk, at your, 
notepad or however it is that you write. Uh, and the other is, I guess, I get a lot of writers who ask about sort of the path to publication, and I'm happy to talk about how that went for me. But I think aspiring writers think about that too much. Um, and the truth is that if you write a really good book, you will get published. And that, that, that is a problem that will take care of itself if you are good at your craft. So my approach was I, I would spend, you know, I was working full-time running a business. I had a family. I would spend five years writing a novel. And then I would spend six months trying to get it, trying to, to, for, to find it a home. And there was a point at which I just said, you know something, I, I'm, uh, you know, I was getting a little farther along the pathway each time. Um, but it was like, oh, clearly this is, you know, I'm getting the same kinds of comments. And so I don't want to spend another five years fixing this book that's probably flawed to begin with. So I just began the next book. And all I did was focus on writing that next book for the next period of time. And then when it was done, as good as I could make it, then I spent six months thinking about the publishing piece. So, you know, that was how I did it. Um, and it's not how everybody does it for sure. But I think if writers really lean into the craft, if they really think about how to tell a great story, how to, how to write compelling characters, how to, you know, how to, how to write good sentences and good dialogue, um, the publishing part will take care of itself. Um, you know, it might take a little while, but, uh, you know, I think that piece of it is, uh, is overemphasized often with writers. Yeah, that's, uh, great. that's great advice, uh, Nick, really great advice. And yeah, like the, the sticking with it. <laughs> well, we, we all have these, this, this voice in our head, right, that tells us that, oh, it's easier for everybody else. Oh, yeah. we're terrible at this, right? That, that inner critic. Um, and, you know, up until, you know, it wasn't that long ago for me where, like, I really realized that, that writers who are really productive, whose work I really admire, they still have that voice in their head. Right, the the Mark Graneys of the world, the Greg Hurwitzes of the world, you know, they still have that voice. They've just learned how to turn down the volume, you know. And that is just that is the human condition, really. And so it doesn't mean you're a bad writer. It just means that you know you're paying too much attention to that that mean mean voice in your head. Uh, and so for me, it's it's really you know kind of a a, a, a process of trying to learn to listen to the, the kinder voices in my head and to try to tune out the voice that's telling me I'm no good. And, and I think, you know, if you can, if you can learn to do that and just keep going, that you will get there. All right. And what can, uh, where can the listeners find you? What's uh, your, your website? Uh, my website is nickpetrie.com. Uh, I've got links to my socials there. Uh, you can certainly find me on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram pretty easily. Uh, my, uh, handles are, are simple variations on my name, nothing too freaky. Um, so easy to find. And, uh, you know, if you got a question, reach out on social, it's easy. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for coming on and uh, chatting with us. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Oh, it's my pleasure, Alan. Thanks so much for your interest and uh, good luck with the rest of your fine day. Thank you for listening to Meet the Thriller Author. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with one of your favorite writers of mysteries and thrillers, or if this episode's guest is new to you, I hope you give their books a chance. Helping listeners discover new authors and books is one of the coolest outcomes of doing this podcast. As always, you can head over to thrillerauthors.com to sign up to my Thrilling Reads email list. That way you won't miss out on any great deals in thriller and mystery books. You can also check out all the links and resources in the show notes for this episode over at thrillerauthors.com. And also please do subscribe to this podcast if you haven't done so already and leave a rating and review wherever it is that you're listening to this uh, show. If you have done that already, I thank you. Uh, I really do appreciate your support. For my other links to my author website, social media haunts, and more uh, check out thrillingreads.com forward slash links all my links will be uh, on that uh, page so that's it for this episode uh, see you next time and stay safe out there <laughs>